So uh, today we're going to be going over the respiratory system. And so this is a really important system, especially with everything going on right now. Uh, so as, as you guys had mentioned earlier, so um, this is a really important system and it's actually going to be really important um, in terms of working with the cardiovascular system. Okay. So the role of the cardiovascular system, if we go back to last week, is to move oxygen throughout the body uh, and then take that oxygen and deliver, that, uh, deliver it into different tissues that need it. Okay. At the same time we're delivering oxygen, we're going to be getting rid of carbon dioxide. Okay. But the only way to get carbon dioxide or get oxygen into the body and then carbon dioxide out of it is with the respiratory system. Okay. So the respiratory system is going to be used to help bring in oxygen, um, which can then be delivered into the blood, and then be able to remove carbon dioxide from the blood and then exhale that into the uh, into the environment. So as we see, this is, these are going to be two systems that are going to rely heavily on each other in order to do the jobs that they need to do. So when we take a look at the respiratory system, uh, it's going to be broken down into two zones. Um, the first zone is called the conducting zone. Um, and so that's going to be the series of zone or a series of tubes uh, that is going to be involved with just moving or conducting the air from the atmosphere into the lungs. Okay. So uh, while the air is getting moved from the air into the lungs, um, it's also going to be getting filtered. Uh, a lot of different different pathogens and um, debris and ash and pollen like that. Things like that are going to be um, stopped from getting into the lungs um, using some different types different techniques like uh, the um, nose hairs, for example. Uh, mucus and the stilly that are inside the respiratory tract, they're all going to be responsible for, for catching all of those pathogens and getting rid of those. Um, we're just going to help to uh, warm the air that comes into our body and then moisten it as well. Okay, so if portions of the respiratory system that are involved with the conducting zone are the nasal cavity, which we see over here, uh, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, and then the bronchi and bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles that are inside the lungs. Yeah. So those are just involved with just moving air from the atmosphere into the lungs. Okay. So no gas exchange takes place inside the conducting zone. Okay. The place where gas exchange does take place is inside the respiratory zone, uh, which is specifically inside the lungs, inside the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and uh, most importantly, the alveoli. Okay. Uh, and so this is going to be where we're going to be exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air spaces inside the lungs and the pulmonary uh, capillaries. And so we'll take a look at those in a, in a little more detail uh, in a second here. Okay. And so there's going to be two processes to um, kind of breathing here. The first one is inhalation or also called inspiration. And so that is a process that's going to involve bringing air in. So it's going to be moving air from the conducting zone into the respiratory zone. Okay. And then exhalation or expiration works the opposite direction. We're going to be breathing out and moving air from the respiratory zone okay, down here into the conducting zone and then eventually into the environment. Okay. Uh, all right, so in the alveoli, um, this is gonna be one of the major places where we're gonna see gas exchange actually occurring. Okay. And so when we look at the alveoli, the alveoli are gonna be these little uh, kind of air sacs around the lungs, okay, or inside the lungs here. Um, and all of these air sacs are going to have pulmonary capillaries actually wrapped around them. Okay. And so because the pulmonary capillary walls are so thin and the walls of the alveoli are so thin, air is able to actually diffuse directly between the epithelium of the alveoli okay, and the epithelium of the blood okay, and be able to drop uh, oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide in the opposite direction. Okay. So we're gonna have lots of oxygen moving from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. And then from there, uh, the heart will then be able to move, or sorry, the, yeah, the, the pulmonary capillaries will then be able to move that uh, oxygenated blood back into the heart. Um, at the same time, we're delivering oxygen into the uh, pulmonary capillaries. Carbon dioxide is going to be moving from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli and then eventually get breathed out. Okay. So again, this is going to be one of the few places and the really the major place where we're going to see gas exchange occurring. Okay. All right, so when we take a look at respiration, um, respiration is the process of moving gases throughout the atmosphere, the blood, and the body cells. And so it's gonna be happening in three different steps. The first step is called ventilation or just regular old breathing. And so this is where you're moving air um, from the atmosphere into the air spaces of the lung and vice versa. Okay. That's just gonna be the process of inhaling and exhaling. Okay, just moving air from the atmosphere into the lungs and from the lungs back into the atmosphere. Okay. So that's just ventilation, nothing special there. Okay. 
The second process is external respiration, or also called pulmonary respiration. And so this happens inside the alveoli. Okay. So pulmonary respiration is gonna be a process, or external respiration, is gonna be the process where we're gonna be breathing in oxygen. Okay. And then from there, that oxygen inside the alveoli is then going to diffuse into the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. And that's gonna allow the blood to now be oxygenated. Okay. At the same time, we're dropping off oxygen into the pulmonary capillaries. The other thing that's gonna be happening is we're gonna be moving carbon dioxide from the, from the blood into the alveoli. Okay, so we're exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. So once we do this, carbon dioxide is going to end up into the alveoli, and then we're eventually going to breathe that out into the atmosphere. Okay. So the blood is going to be gaining oxygen and then losing carbon dioxide um, here inside the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. Uh, the second process is internal respiration, or also called tissue respiration. And so that's going to be the process of taking oxygenated blood Okay, and delivering that oxygen to various tissues. Okay. So for example, here we might have a capillary, let's say this is a muscle cell. Okay. And so we're gonna wanna deliver oxygen to our muscle cell here. Okay. And so we're gonna have oxygen diffusing from the red blood cell um, into the interstitial fluid, and then eventually into um, that muscle cell or whatever cell we're looking at here. Okay. So once this cell re receives that oxygen, it's then gonna use it to produce ATP and it's gonna be, end up producing carbon dioxide. From there, that carbon dioxide will then move from the uh, muscle cell into the red blood cell and then end up getting delivered back to the heart and eventually back to the lungs. Okay. So in these two processes, we have kind of the opposite movement of these gases. So in external respiration, we're going to be moving oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide into the lungs. Okay. In uh, internal respiration, we're going to be moving oxygen out of the blood and moving carbon dioxide into the blood from there. So one thing to keep in mind is that external respiration and inhalation are not the same thing. External respiration and exhalation are not the same thing. If they're two different processes, uh, one has to, uh, inhalation and exhalation just deals with moving air. Okay. External and internal respiration have to deal with moving oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, between the blood and whatever tissue we're looking at. Okay. Then the last type of respiration that we're going to see is called cellular respiration. And this is just the process of a cell using oxygen here okay, in order to make ATP and then using carbon dioxide, producing carbon dioxide as a waste. Okay. Any questions on any of these processes happening here? No? Okay, cool. All right, so that brings us into kind of where we're gonna be going with today's lab. So um, in in a, in a kind of hospital setting, one of the things that we want to be able to do is be able to assess um, our patient's lung, uh, lung health. Okay? And so one of the things that, or one of the different types of tests that we're going to be able to perform is called a pulmonary function test. Okay? So what a pulmonary function test does, it helps to show the different volumes of, of uh, air that's going to be moving in and out of the lungs with different types of inhalation and exhalation processes. Okay? Uh, and then by looking at those values, by looking at the amount of uh, the volume of air moving, are you able to diagnose whether that patient's got you know, healthy lungs or if they have an obstructive pulmonary disease or a restrictive pulmonary disease. Okay. And so one of the techniques um, used for pulmonary function tests is called a spirometry. Um, and so a spirometry is a process where you take a clip and you add it to someone's nose. Okay. And so you kind of shut their nostrils and you have them breathe out through their mouth okay, through a spirometer, okay, which we see in this tool down here. Okay. So again, based on the amount of air moving in and out of the spirometer, Okay, this machine is going to pick up on those values and then be able to determine you know, how much air you're able to move in and out of the lungs and then compare that to what a healthy lung should be able to do. Okay. So it's going to be able to measure all those respiratory volumes. So when we look at these respiratory volumes, there's going to be four major volumes that we're going to be paying the most attention to. Okay. The first one is called tidal volume, and so that is the more uh, the, the, the volume of air that you're just kind of inspiring and expiring at rest. So you're just quiet breathing. So when you're just sitting down, um, you know, watching TV or, you know, in the middle of a lecture, when you're just normally just breathing in and out like normal, that's going to be your tidal volume, okay? the amount of air that you're able to inhale and exhale at rest. Okay? That's what we see here. So typically, um, tidal volume should be anywhere from about 500 to 800 milliliters of air. Okay. Um, the next one is inspiratory reserve volume. Okay? And so inspiratory reserve volume 
is the amount of air that you're able to forcefully inspire after a regular tidal inspiration. Okay. So if you imagine yourself just kind of breathing like normal, I'll kind of just exaggerate so you guys can see. And then if I were to take an, a slight a normal inhalation, and then a big one after that, that amount of air that I was able to inhale okay, after that tidal inspiration is the inspiratory reserve volume, okay, or the IRV. Okay. The opposite of the IRV is the expiratory reserve volume. Okay. And so that's the amount of air that you're able to expire after a tidal expiration. Okay. So again, if you just breathe normally, and then once you breathe out as a normal expiration, you forcefully breathe all the way out as much as you can. Okay. That amount of air that you're able to expire okay, is the expiratory reserve volume. Okay, the ERV. Okay. Now, even after you exhale all of this air out, there's still going to be some volume of air that's still going to be trapped inside the lungs. Okay, so the, the the air that remains inside the lungs, okay, after a forced exhalation or expiration, is called the residual volume, or that's the uh, last amount of air that's still left over in the lungs. Okay, that is stuff you cannot expire. That's stuff you cannot exhale all the way out. Okay, so that's the residual volume, whatever is left over inside the lungs after a forced expiration. Okay. And again, ideally that should be around 1200 milliliters of air. Okay. Again, it could be more or less depending on the person's health or um, size. Okay. Uh, now the problem with residual volume is you cannot actually measure this through spirometry. Okay. And the reason for that is spirometry only measures the amount of air that you're able to breathe in or breathe out. Okay. It cannot measure the amount of air that's left over in the lungs because that air is not moving into the spirometer itself. Okay. And so for that reason, the spirometer cannot measure your respiratory volume. Okay. It can only measure these other three, the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, and the expiratory reserve volumes. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Is every, everyone still yeah. able to hear me okay? Yep. Let me just make sure I didn't. Yeah. Sense. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. Got a little nervous there. All right, say that one more time. No? Okay. Yeah, we heard you. Okay. So these are some of the definitions of these volumes. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. So these are the volumes of these, uh, of these different types of volumes here and the definitions of them. Um, and this, again, kind of shows you how you're able to measure them through a spirometer. And so for tidal volume, uh, if you were to put someone, uh, hook up someone up to a spirometer, you would just have them breathe in and out normally, and it would record the amount of air that's able to move in and out of the lungs, okay? or the amount of air coming into and out of the spirometer. To measure the inspiratory reserve volume, we'd have someone uh, inhale as much as possible through the spirometer and then exhale out. Okay. In order to measure the expiratory reserve volume, you'd have them exhale as much as possible and then inhale back up to normal. And then again, with the residual volume, you cannot measure that uh, through spirometry. Okay. That one, you can only measure through an autopsy with the amount of air left over. Okay. All right, so then, so those are those values, uh, the, the major volumes that are gonna be important. Uh, there's also a few other capacities, which are just um, combinations of different volumes that are gonna be important to tell us different things about, um, or different, different information about the person's um, respiratory health. Okay. So the first one is called the inspiratory capacity. And so the inspiratory capacity is the total amount of air that you're able to inspire. Okay. So you, you would start with a normal expiration. Okay, you just kind of breathe out normally and then you breathe in as much as possible, okay? So if I were to breathe out and then breathe in, you have that amount of air that I was able to fully inhale or inspire would be the inspiratory capacity, okay? So that encompasses the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume, okay? That would, uh, that would equal your inspiratory capacity, okay? The functional residual capacity or the FRC if that is the amount of air left over in the lungs after a quiet expiration. Okay? So after you just do a normal, normal regular expiration, the amount of air that's still left over in my lungs okay, would be considered the functional residual capacity. Okay? So that would be the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. Okay? Whatever's left over in the lungs plus whatever you would be able to forcefully exhale okay, if you did. Okay? So that's the functional reserve or residual capacity. The vital capacity is one that's gonna be most important to help us understand a person's um, respiratory health. Okay? 
So the vital capacity is the total amount of air that you're able to breathe in, starting with an, a full expiration, okay, or going the opposite direction, okay. So for example, if you were to breathe in, uh, you take a, a full breath in, okay, as much as possible, and then breathe all that air out, even into a forceful expiration, that total amount of air that you're able to breathe out is considered your vital capacity. Okay. So the total amount of air that you're able to expel, uh, to expel after the deepest possible breath you're able to take. Okay. So that is made up by the tidal volume, the uh, inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. Okay. So again, that's the total amount of air that you're able to breathe out starting with a full inspiration. Uh, and then the last one, so that you can count, yeah, so I think I mentioned that already. Okay, last one is the total lung capacity. The total lung capacity is just the total amount of air that your lungs are able to hold. Okay. Um, and so that would take everything into consideration here. Um, the easiest way to calculate that is by um, adding up the vital capacity plus the residual volume. Okay. Um, so the vital capacity plus the residual volume would give you your total lung capacity. Again, that would be the total amount of air that you're able to actually um, move plus the amount of air that you're not able to move. Okay. Okay. Um, you can also measure it with any of these other ones. You can uh, add the inspiratory capacity to the uh, functional residual uh, capacity or just add everything, all of these values up. Okay. Ideally, the total lung capacity should be about six liters uh, or 6,000 milliliters in, in, um, of air. Okay. okay, so those are the different capacities. Uh, are there any questions on any of these capacities here and how we would calculate these or how, how uh, these are explained? No. no. Okay, cool. All righty. So those are the respiratory capacities. And now vital capacity, or also called uh, forced vital capacity, is one of the most important um, indicators of lung health. Okay, It's going to be able to tell you a lot about what's going on with that individual's health. Um, it can tell you if their lung health is normal or it can tell them if you're dealing with some kind of obstructive pulmonary disease or a restrictive pulmonary disease. Okay. And so typically, like I said, your vital capacity um, should be around 4,800 milliliters or close to five liters because your residual volume should be about one liter, total about six liters in, in, um, for, for total air. Okay. So vital capacity should be close to five liters. Um, but if your vital capacity is lower than that, okay, that tells you of a number of different uh, problems that that person could be dealing with. Um, one issue is that they might have pneumonia, and so their lungs are not able to fully expand, okay? um, or their alveoli are not able to fully uh, fill with air. Um, it can lead to a restrictive disorder, which just means the air, the, the lungs are not able to expand all the way out. Okay? Um, they could be dealing with a um, carcinoma, a bronchiogenic carcinoma, which means you just have cancer inside the lungs, uh, or you have pulmonary congestion, where there's something that's actually causing uh, congestion inside the lungs here. So any one of these things can be contributing to a lower than normal vital capacity. Okay. Uh, now, one of the other major values that's important for helping to identify um, different uh, lung health or different aspects of lung health is called the forced expiratory volume. Okay. And so forced expiratory volume, or FEV, uh, is the total amount of air that you're able to expire, and specifically over a, a series of uh, periods of time. Okay. Um, and so, for example, you're usually going to see these as FEV1, FEV2 or FEV3, okay? These just tell you the volume of air that you're able to expire in one second, that would be your FEV1. FEV2 would be the total amount of air that you're able to expire over two seconds. And FEV3 is the total amount of air that you're able to expire over three seconds, okay? Uh, so, uh, again, a normal uh, FEVs will tell you that someone's got normal lung health. But again, if that FEV number is lower than normal, that will usually indicate some kind of obstructive pulmonary issue. Okay. And I'll talk about what those are in a second. Okay. So normally the uh, forced exhalation, okay, uh, or sorry, the forced expiratory volumes okay, should be at a specific values. Okay. So your FEV1 should be about 70 to 85% of your vital capacity. Okay. So over one second, you should be able to expire about 70 to 85% of your total uh, forced uh, vital capacity. Okay. Over uh, For your FEV2, you should be able to breathe out about 94% of the air of your vital capacity um, over two seconds. FEV3, you should be able to breathe out 97% of your vital capacity over three seconds. Okay. Okay. So if these values are less than they um, 
then less than that, okay, that's going to kind of be an indication that there's something going on in that person's respiratory system. So these are a few, or kind of a, a graph here that kind of shows uh, like what this would look like. Okay. So for an obstructive pulmonary disease, um, obstructive pulmonary disease means that there's something that's physically obstructing uh, the airflow in the lungs. Okay. So it can either be due to you know, extra mucus inside the lungs, um, it can be due to kind of a constriction within the lungs or within the, within the bronchioles or bronchi or something like that, but there's some kind of limitation that causes the airflow to slow down uh, or completely be obstructed. Okay. So a couple examples of these would be emphysema, where the alveoli are broken down and they're not able to uh, fully get air uh, into the, the, the pulmonary capillaries. Um, you can have chronic bronchitis, where you have an extra mucus inside the lungs um, or inside the respiratory system. And so because you have more mucus, there's less uh, area for the air to flow through. Um, bronchio or bronchiectasis, where it just causes constriction of the bronchi or asthma. Uh, and so with obstructive pulmonary diseases, we'll usually see normal lung capacity. Um, you'll see a normal vital capacity typically, but the FEV1 is usually going to be decreased. Okay. And so one of the really big issues, or one of the really big measurements for helping to understand uh, what kind of disease you're looking at is by looking at the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Okay. So the FEV1 to FVC ratio should be, you know, about uh, close to close to one-ish or close to, close to about 80%, I should say. Should be at close to 80%. Um, but in FEV, and sorry, in an obstructive pulmonary disease, the FEV1 over FVC ratio is less than 80%. So about 70 or lower. Um, that would give you an indication on someone's dealing with obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay. Uh, and someone who has a restricted pulmonary disease, that just means their lungs are not able to fully expand. There's something that's physically restricting it from doing so. Uh, and so that can be uh, due to like an interstitial lung disease. It can be due to pulmonary fibrosis, where the lungs are just uh, kind of made of mostly scar tissue, and so they don't expand as well. Um, sarcoidosis, uh, uh, of neuro, uh, neuromuscular diseases within the chest wall. Okay, any of those can cause the lungs to not be able to expand um, to their full ability. Okay, and so because the lungs cannot fully expand, that causes their total lung capacity to decrease. Okay? Because the total lung capacity decreases, it causes a reduction in their uh, their vital capacity. And so in this case, the FEV1 would be either normal or slightly reduced. Okay. But the FEV1 to FEC ratio would be normal because both the lung capacity and the forced vital capacity would be about the same. Okay. Okay, so I'll just kind of leave it there. Uh, any questions on FEV, FEV1 or so here? No? Okay. So FEV1 is going to be the major uh, FEV1 and the, the vital capacity, those are going to be the two major indications of someone's health okay, or pulmonary health. Okay, so for lab today, we would be using a spirometer um, in our lab groups, but unfortunately, again, we cannot do this. So uh, what we'll be doing today instead, and I'll kind of pull up our lab for today, okay, uh, is we're going to be watching a couple videos on respiration. Okay. So one of the videos will show you uh, kind of what, it, what a, a spirometer would look like and how you would actually perform it in a, um, you know, in a clinical setting. The other video goes over all the different values and what they mean, okay, and what they mean for that person's health. Okay. So is everyone able to see the, the chapter four or the lab 14 assignment here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to watch these two videos. Uh, and then the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to look at these two figures, okay? So this first figure uh, shows uh, the different lung capacity or the different um, results that you might get from a uh, spirometer, okay? And so this is what you see here. This is going to be from one of your patients. The second figure is going to show you the amount of air that you're able to expire or that your patient is able to expire um, over time, okay? So, uh, this is again is going to be the expired volume, the amount that you're able to expire for a healthy individual, and then a patient that's dealing with COPD. Okay. So this will be the the forced vital capacity, okay, around five uh, liters for the healthy individual. Okay, for uh, uh, someone dealing with COPD, it's going to be around this level here. Okay. So what you're going to do, based off of these two figures, is for figure one, you're going to identify 
uh, or give an estimate of what you think the tidal volume would be, the inspiratory reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volume, and the estimated res uh, reserve volume as well. Okay. And so you're going to use figure one to do that. For figure two, you're going to write down the FVC for the healthy patient uh, and the FEV1 for the healthy patient as well, as well as the FVC and the FEV1 for the COPD patient. Okay. And so you should be able to figure that out just by looking at these two graphs. Okay. Once you do that, you're going to answer these two or these three questions here, uh, and then you will be good to go for this lab. Cool. Any questions on what we're doing for this assignment here? 